It's such a pleasure to be here today on Canada Day. Thanks so much, each and every one of you, for coming out to celebrate here at this very um, incredible museum. The Chinese Canadian um, Museum has been here for a year. It's its birthday. And um, the exhibit here has been really important and will be traveling the country. Before I uh, go into the introductions, though, I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded traditional stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. We honor them and their uh, stewardship of the land. The site we're on right now has a lot of history, as we well know. And what I find is that poetry is a portal to way, a way to honor the experiences and uh, memories of, of so many. And I just came from a workshop, actually, and some of you were participants in that workshop where we were working on poetry and history. And today we have two terrific poets that you're going to hear today, and then we're going to have a discussion after you hear their poems about um, writing poetry about history. But before we start, um, I wanted to share uh, just a little bit of something that I touched upon in the workshop uh, today. Um, so we can see that uh, we have our three speakers here on the uh, monitor there. And um, I might need some assistance with the screen, Rosalie, uh, to get to the next uh, screen. Okay, what I'd like to show you right now is a very uh, new poetry video. I started as a poet laureate uh, for Vancouver in 2022, and my City Poems project was to encourage uh, people to engage with history, culture, and ecology of the city through uh, poetry and poetry videos. And this poetry video uh, was something that I worked on with a group of students in grade five and six at Tecumseh Elementary in East Van. And they all wrote poems about Vivian Jung. Who here knows who Vivian Jung is? Okay, some of you. She was this young woman who wanted to become a teacher, and she needed to get a life-saving certificate in order to become a teacher but there was a ban on Asians and blacks uh, to swim at the Crystal Pool, both the Crystal Pool in Vancouver and the one in Victoria. But what happened when she was barred from the pool is that her coach and her fellow students protested with her to uh, let her be admitted, and then she was. And the color ban, after some other protests that followed, um, ended that ban. And she became a teacher, the first Chinese-Canadian teacher hired by the Vancouver School Board. She was hired in 1950. And she stayed at Tecumseh for 35 years. Uh, and she was an incredible teacher who was an award-winning coach for volleyball and field hockey and basketball teams there and uh, was quite a role model for many students and for other student teachers. Um, and she is remembered through the students' poems that I worked on with them. And what I did was I took lines from each of those student poems and turned it into a collage poem or a cento poem and then into a poetry video with the help of a videographer friend. At the segregated crystal pool, crystal clear waters, crystal clear rules, shimmering shining pool of dreams for those of the right race. The parks board permitting only two hours a week for Asians and blacks to swim. It started small, like a bright star shining. Vivian waited in line, ready to learn, needing a life-saving certificate to become a teacher. Pool staff tried to turn her away. You can't enter here, but she knew she was right. Born in Mare, BC, she too had sung O Canada all her life. Her coach and fellow students refused to enter the pool without her. Those friends, those allies, fighting for the rights of all Asians and Blacks, united courage, the courage to say, we are equal. They didn't back down. Doors that were closed were then flung wide open. Diving board springing, unfiltered laughter, 
Splash. Vivian jumped off the diving board into refreshing freedom, into equality so clear and clean. The pool, gleaming, sparkling, glittering, now accessible to everyone. Imagine the pride she felt. Exclusion from pools no more. When she broke the color man, she broke down rigid minds, made a whole city know she was right, and swam into teaching for 35 glorious years. What a wonderful teacher she would become, an inspiration. First Chinese Canadian teacher hired by the Vancouver School Board, coaching girls volleyball teams to city championships, sharing her love of softball, dance, and present at Tecumseh Elementary for decades. How do we solve inequality? Thank you, Vivian and Alan, for showing us the way. So, <laughs> it's so great hearing those students' voices. They really got into it <laughs> when they were reading the poem. So, I wanted to show you another um, poem that I did. It's uh, what's called a blackout or erasure poem. And what I did was I took um, a document, um, a restrictive covenant, which is like a special contract on property, which prevented um, owners, white owners of property in uh, West Vancouver, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island, all through the province and through the country, from allowing uh, Asians and blacks to own property. And it's still registered on property uh, in many, many places, and people don't know about it. Of course, it's of no force and effect as of 1978, when legislation was passed to make it null and void. But these provisions were try to, trying to create uh, and disempower um, um, uh, Asian Canadians, blacks, from owning property. And so I wanted to empower, re-empower um, us as... Uh, black, indigenous, and uh, Asian and Canadians to say that we do belong. So I took the provision of that uh, restrictive covenant, which basically said, um, no poultry, swine, sheep, cows, cattle, or other livestock shall be kept on the premises. No person of the African or Asiatic race or of African or Asiatic descent, except servants of the occupier of the premises and residence, shall reside or be allowed to remain on the premises. So it's trying to enforce a certain kind of uh, uh, segregation. Uh, very similar to the kind of exclusion that was happening with the Exclusion Act, as you see in this exhibit here. So what I did is I, I took those two provisions, copied them five times, and then circled certain words, and then erased the other words with my mom's uh, Chinese watercolor brush and ink. And I created this poem. No other, no race, all allowed. Africans, Asians, all shall reside, all shall remain. All shall allow all to remain. So it's just a way that maybe you might want to write poems of your own uh, to turn, subvert, uh, exclusionary, restrictive, hurtful language into something positive. Anyways, that leads into some poems that we're going to hear today from the two poets we have in front of us. First, we're going to hear from James Wang. James Wang is a writer, physician, and Chinese-Canadian settler on the unceded indigenous lands of Vancouver. His poems have been published in Canadian literary magazines and in two collaborative chapbooks, Brine and Adventitious Sounds. His work has also been featured at the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Classical Chinese Garden, CBC Radio, Mountain View Cemetery, and the Mount Pleasant Community Arts Screen. He is a member of the emerging poets group Harbor Center Five. Drawing from his experience as a 1.5 generation immigrant, the dynamic space between old and new Chinese cultures is a frequent theme in his poetry. His poem, Found, was inspired by the Chinese bachelors buried without names or identities at Vancouver Mountain View Cemetery at the turn of the 20th century. 
one of his newest and yet unpublished poems, after excluding a Chinaman at any length, aims to reclaim the words of Canada's first prime minister and others who enacted laws to prevent Chinese immigrants from voting. So why don't we hear from James first, and I'll introduce uh, Chris later. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, and, and for those of you who might not know, Fiona was actually my teacher um, about five years ago as I was getting back uh, into writing more formally, and um, I uh, have a lot to owe to her and a lot of thanks to her, um, and, you know, as our uh, Asian-Canadian uh, uh, way of honoring our teachers, I want to say thank you. Um, I'm going to read two poems today, and uh, the first one was inspired by uh, the Vancouver Poet Laureate, Fiona's um, uh, urge for us to pay attention to the city around us, and to pay attention to what is there, what is the history of Vancouver, even little things that we might not notice. So the part I paid attention to was Mountain View Cemetery, which is over um, by Fraser in 41st. Uh, and they have an incredible list of archives there, and some of it's available online. Uh, so I went and I wanted to see who was buried there, just out of curiosity. Um, and I saw that there were multiple names that just said unknown person or unknown man, unknown woman. Uh, and then I looked and there were some that said unknown Chinese man. And I thought, huh, I wonder how they got there. Um, so that's, this is how this poem called Found came to be. It is actually also a video poem that you can find on um, uh, Fiona's website, which is fionalam.net, um, on her blog, and it's also being played at the Mount Pleasant uh, Community Arts Screen until April 2025. Okay. Found for an unknown Chinese man in Mountain View Cemetery. We used to play up the hill, bunkered under granite wings. I wander tall among ancestors now, footsteps buoyed on the breeze, stone islets stay supine. They beckon to me, a roster call of chews and chins, soons and lees. Here, in no man's land, I am every man's son. They beg me to crouch, to smell the moss transfused with tangerines, to touch my beating palm to the earth. I tell them of my voyages up the hill, surveys of shipwrecked sirens, they nod along their dandelion heads. I ask if they are lost. Wingbeats inscribed their epitaphs. Dragonflies floating in Toysan wind, atom by atom, a pilgrimage to pillars of dust. Some are called home to the mountains some to the sea's rising tide. The rest go with me back up the hill. Thank you. And the second poem that I'm going to read is, uh, hasn't been published yet. Um, and uh, this is the first time I'm reading it. Uh, the title is After Excluding a Chinaman at Any Length, and as you can tell, it uses some historical language. Um, this poem is also an erasure poem, the, the kind of poem where you take out words from the original document, and I was inspired by historical documents, um, and the one I took is the um, Electoral Franchise Act, which is back in 1885. There was a huge debate in Ottawa about whether people of Chinese and indigenous ancestry could vote or not. Uh, so I looked at it. I was quite appalled with some of the language and arguments that were made, and I thought I'd turn it into a poem. 
Um, and all of the words in this poem come from Sir John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister. And I actually have uh, copies of the text here. It looks like this. Um, and you can see the black out parts are the original text and the white parts are the words I left in. So I'll pass these around just for you to look at and I'll collect them from you at the end. Thank you so much. And again, all of the words are in the same order that they were in, in the text. And all I did was take out the words that were in between to change the meaning of the poem. After excluding a Chinaman at any length, Sir John A. Macdonald, the Chinese of Canada are tired of it. When the Chinaman comes, he does not bring his family with him. He is in a strange land. He has paid for it, and the owner gets his money. If he cannot, his executors send his body back. Sir John A. Macdonald, the honorable gentleman, cannot quite understand that Chinese working men, laborers, and settlers are moral, wise, and just, altogether abhorrent to the Aryan race and Aryan principles. This house, amusingly, did not think in intellect, in morality. The truth is, if you look around the world, you will see the future. Our hundred millions in all the races are equal and never will be broken. Wherever they go, you will find that they unite in the East and in the West, in large numbers, in spirit, in feeling, in everything. You see, wherever there is solemn protest, there is no necessity for Sir John A. Macdonald. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I love that sort of subversiveness, right? To be very subversive and turn John A. Macdonald on his head there uh, and using his words against him. <laughs> Fantastic. Our next poet is a wonderful spoken word poet from the Yukon. Christopher C. is an educator, organizer, and award-winning writer. He placed second at both the 2011 Poetry Slam World Cup and 2016 in the Rio International Poetry Slam, and continues, he says, to miss the top of the podium in most areas of his life. I would disagree with that. I think you were in the top of the podium for me. Christopher has shared the stage with uh, Leanne Badasomaki Simpson, Shane Koizen, and Mustafa the Poet, and his work has appeared on stages, screens, and graffiti walls worldwide. You can find him on YouTube, people. He is passionate about using poetry to share stories of resistance, community, and basketball. His first children's book, A Song for the Paper Children, you can see it up on there on the table, uh, A Song for Paper Children was released in May 2024 with Plum Leaf Press. And I know that Chris will stay around to sign books for those of you who are interested. Christopher lives with his dog in White Horse, Yukon. Welcome, Christopher. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Happy Humiliation Day. Um, a few years ago, I was driving across the country with my mom. We left Victoria and we drove out east. Uh, that's where her family's mostly located in Quebec and Ontario. And as we were driving, we talked a lot about what it meant to be Canadian. My mom has always been one of the proudest Canadians that I can remember. And at the time, I was um, quite militant in my uh, desire not to be complicit in, in ongoing 
Canadian colonialism here, and um, we kind of got into this back and forth as to, you know, what Canadian pride means versus Canadian gratitude. And that's kind of where we settled on as to um, my, my mom's uh, pride is not something, and being Canadian is not something that I can necessarily take away from her um, for all of my, uh, you know, progressive millennial pol political bent. Uh, I can't remove that from her because her experience is her experience. Um, but for myself, I, I was able to articulate perhaps for the first time to my mom, um, while I'm grateful to be a Canadian citizen, to be born on this, on this land, um, pride cannot come uh, when the origins of our nation are uh, on the backs of uh, stolen land and built on the backs of stolen people. So. Um, Whenever it comes to July 1st, we kind of have this little back and forth on WhatsApp where mom will be like, happy Canada Day in the family text. And I'll be like, prayer hands emoji. <laughs> and we just kind of leave it at that. Um, but I think that's a reminder for, uh, I, I won't say for anyone else but myself, just on a day like this to, to consider that gratitude of what it means to be Canadian uh, and what responsibility and obligations it bestows upon me uh, to continue to resist um, the ways that colonialism uh, marches forward, uh, both here uh, on Turtle Island, but also around the world. Uh, many circumstances that we're seeing play out right now. Anyway, that's my soapbox. <laughs> uh, I'll get off of it and I'll share some words that rhyme. Um, I'll do three poems today. Uh, the first one is about silence, the second one is about food, and the third one is about the paper children. So this first one is on silence. The day my grandchild comes to me and asks, where were you? A history book will unfold before my eyes, its brittle spine snapping like a leather belt, some pages yet unwritten, dripping with the blood, sweat, and tears that brought our oriental ancestors across the ocean, seeking a dream that turned out to be more like a myth. Where were you? When CPR foremen sent trembling Chinamen with frail fingers clutching sticks of dynamite into the mountains to blow their way through the tunnels, where were you? When head tax and immigration acts split countless Chinese families down the middle like steamed pork buns, where were you? When the boat people landed in the dead of winter, promptly pushed to the ghettos with the rest of the rabble, where were you? When Nikkei fishing boats were impounded, their nets deemed a threat to wartime security, 22,000 Japanese sent to the mountains to meditate on all the ways they don't belong to this country. The day my grandchild comes to me with puffy eyes, asking me where I was the first time I got called a chink, Asking me why it still hurts this bad in a country that says it welcomes us all, I will be forced to contend with all the times I have kept my head down and pulled my bootstraps up. A history of silence that speaks louder than a Hiroshima bomb. See, we have never been a loud people, only hardworking. After all, chopsticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you, right? So work hard, Jai. Don't talk back. We're lucky to be here to get to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, railways and laundromats, to prosperity and graduation caps. They might not love us the way they love our food, but they pay our mortgages while we paid our dues. The first time my grandchild asks, so what did you do? When they knelt on a black man's neck till he died. When they trespassed and attacked First Nations healing camps. When they called it Kung Flu and spit on our grandmas at bus stops. What did you do? And where were you? when black Canadians paved the way for our emancipation, when local natives pulled our broken bodies from collapsed railway tunnels and nursed us back to health, bending cedar and weaving bamboo, did you fight for them when they fought for you? I want to tell them, we tried, we stood, we fought, we could. No longer just doctors, lawyers, engineers, but allies, artists, athletes, activists. Every Chinatown in Little Manila in act of defiance. Every stoic action mistaken for silence. Here we are standing on the shoulders of humble giants. Their silence meant survival so that now we can speak. Now we can strive. Now we can struggle. Now we can thrive. When they asked me what I did, 
I want to tell them I tried. <laughs> On food. To the girl with the orange fiaw ribbon backpack who just took a selfie in front of roast ducks hanging in a Chinese restaurant window. I hope the Siu Ah meets your aesthetic. I hope that you are an influencer and that your post brings one billion blessings upon this restaurant. I do not know if their Siu Ah is any good, but I do know that for every like your post gets, a piece of my great-great-grandfather's ashes reconstitutes itself until he is once again sentient enough to say in one of the five dialects he spoke, I did not cross an ocean to come here to become a teenager's photo shoot. I came here to survive. See, for us immigrants, food has always been about survival. You can take an ancestor out of the motherland, but you can never take a mother's cooking out of the ancestor. My grandmother went to the grave clutching her bean curd recipes like a rosary. They were all she brought with her from a dusty childhood in India. No one will ever lift a clay pot rice like she did. I think of this often. How lonely my grandfather must have been living in small town Quebec for 50 years. His greasy Chinese restaurant, the people's favorite, but only ever barely scraping by because he couldn't stop handing out free egg rolls. His French, come see, come sa, but his Igfu Young, second to none. The only family when he got here who were his father and his father's father. Generations of family split down the middle, again, like steamed pork buns, pushed to the dirty parts of town where only the natives and the dogs were allowed. From the mire sprang up Chinatowns, laundromats and lemon chicken. Nowadays springs up gentrification, bath bomb boutiques and kombucha pop-up seed for us immigrants. Food has always been about survival. My family's history severed, but then stitched back together through the passing down of soup secrets and whispered spices. I think of this often. Sitting at my kitchen table in the Yukon, wrapping dumplings of high bush blueberry and caribou harvested in the good way. This is not the filling that my grandmother would have used, it's true. But as the diaspora forges our own path, so too must our food. So we have been here long enough to know that we can never be here long enough. So this food, it is a lifeline back to a land that sometimes feels impossible to understand, but still, I can taste it. See, food is not just food, Karen. It is survival. You make a smoothie bowl, that is a smoothie bowl. My grandma lifts the lid on her clay pot rice, and that is a story, a map that traces her way from home and back again. When you started your artisanal fur shop, Chad, I wonder if your broth is seasoned with the same salt water that brought us the boat people. In my family, food is how we say, I love you. The day after my dad throws a chair at my brother's head, we sit down and pass the rice like nothing happened. In English, there is only one word for love, but my mother knows five different ways to slice an orange. This doesn't heal trauma. It's true. But for us immigrants, food has always been about survival. So this, this is for your stinky tofu. This is for your boiled moose nose, for your fufu, your Indian tacos, your bannock, your doubles. This poem is for your japche, your gorma sabzi, your masala dosa, your koyasado. This poem is for every kid who's ever been afraid to open their lunchbox in the cafeteria. This time, when they come for our spices, we'll tell them no. This is not a shameless plug, I just literally don't know my own words and I have to read it out of this book. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be able to uh, read a song for the paper children uh, in front of this exhibit. So many are artifacts of the paper children who, who came before us um, and, and paved the way for, for our community and our culture to be here. Uh, so how this came about was last year there was an event in, in the Senate uh, to commemorate the centenary of 100 years of Chinese exclusion. Uh, many Chinese who came before that would argue that it's far more than 100 years as our community has been here uh, as early as the 1600s. Um, but the Immigration Act, the Exclusion Act that came around in 1923, so now we're 101 years of that. Um, and that was what kind of gave rise to the f falsified documents. Um, that, that was why so many of our ancestors are called the paper children. And so this, uh, this was for them. And I'm going <laughs> to read it out of the book.
because again, don't know my own words. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight in the book um, was I was so incredibly honored to have Arlene Chan, who's the daughter of Jean Lum, write the foreword for this book. If you don't know who Jean Lum is, um, consult Wikipedia, because uh, that's an important part of our history, uh, uh, alongside the, the, the trailblazers, the matriarch trailblazers like Vivian Zhang, like Lillian Dick, Senator Lillian Dick, uh, and, and like Jean Lum. This is Jean Lum's words. What do I have to do to be accepted? I'm always looking in from the outside. Jean Lum, Order of Canada. I still remember wet, hot Quebecois summers, wandering the kitchen of my Gonggong's restaurant, tracing my finger on stainless steel countertops, sliding my feet on slick tile floors, a child dodging the frenzied bodies of distant relatives, all of them my great uncles, all of them Toisanese, shouting at each other in slurred village dialect, small men with big wat hay, slinging fried rice and chicken balls with fierce abandon. Outside, a dining room of people wait impatiently for their lunch specials. Désolé, quelques minutes de plus. My grandma repeats in broken French over and over, his smile tired bright, his eyes a disappearing horizon, always searching east, always pointed home. Did he know that coming to Canada would turn out this way? That he would live out the rest of his days scraping by, serving his culture deep fried and assimilated? Gung Gung's restaurant was called Les Rivières Orientales, a tributary of an oriental river flowing across the Pacific Coolies and laborers, yellow peril and cheap slaves, from motherland to stolen land, bent backs and burnt hands to build railway and nation economic immigration. We pledge allegiance to the confederation that advocates our deportation, isolation, dislocation, subjugation, denigration. See, we were never supposed to be here. We were never supposed to become doctors and engineers. We were never meant to make home from ashes to find kin from the masses. We know that when the Chinaman comes here, he intends to return to his own country. He does not bring his family with him. He is a stranger, a sojourner in a strange land. He has no common interest with us. John A. Macdonald, first Prime Minister of Canada. When my great-great-grandfather landed in 1880, I wonder if he could read signs posted on street corners saying no Chinese or dogs allowed. Or did these foreign scribbles amuse him, inspire him in his struggle? Our elders in their journey to the West, what pain did they endure? What shame remained obscured? What names did they take to survive? When Steve Harper apologized to head tax survivors, there was no refund for those who could never afford it. What is the cost for countless families split down the middle like steamed pork buns, family trees pruned far too soon? What reparations for the lonely only caught between generations? Western creature with Eastern features, forever a foreigner, a sojourner in a strange land. Is there a credit for this rootlessness? Can I invoice for this dissonance? They called us the paper children, and how apt. Our identities so fraught, so fragile, so as to collapse, fly away on the wind, big guest energy. See, we have been here long enough to know we can never be here long enough. Our mother tongues will always be too foreign, our food too pungent, our ambition too overzealous, there will always be someone older stock. And if a Chinaman dies in a railway tunnel and a CPR foreman isn't around to record it, does he make a sound? Does the ground open up to welcome him? Our ancestors lie tucked away in rockfall deposits. Their skeletons are the skeletons in democracy's closet. Can you hear them now? Can you see us now? They say we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, but what of our ancestors' nightmares? It's been a hundred years since you legislated our discrimination. What has changed? Third, fourth, fifth generation still estranged. Our elders go to their deathbed still ashamed. Our young ones born in this country still constrained, still told to go home, still spit on at bus stops, still virus, still spies, still foreign interference. We have never been allowed people, but today we stand and we scream for every face that looks like me, every kid who's ever pulled their nose bridge to make it taller, Every time they mocked us because our eyes are smaller, 
This is for our elders, both alive and remembered, for the lessons, the tough and the tender, for our full names, past and present. May they be pronounced, may they be respected, for every chink in the national fabric, every nip in the winter wind of prairie towns and northern hamlets coast to coast on stolen land, every small town jade garden and dragon cafe, every gentrified Chinatown and rusty railway, we are here, we've been here, far longer than the past 100 years. So child, when they tell you to go back where you come from, tell them you come from elbow grease and laundry bleach, broken English and MSG. Hunchback elders and paper sons, you come from. A history of resistance, backbone and persistence, resilience and commitment, tell them you belong. Tell them we belong and show them your hands. These are the same blistered fingers that once clutched railway hammers, that formed fists and family with our native relations, feet bound by tradition but forever forging forward in lockstep recognition that freedom comes towards us in a hundred years. Let us not look back again and mark what's left undone, but instead how far we've come, the fights we have won and the sum of our people, standing proud and equal. The past is the past, let this be the sequel, no longer ashamed and no longer illegal but proud, unrelenting, and home. Three wonderful, powerful poems, Chris, and you can get a copy of that book and get Chris to sign it. You can also watch uh, Chris performing it in the Senate on uh, YouTube. Uh, I've watched it a couple of times and it's still very powerful. And you'll catch all the crafting, the nuance of the poem if you watch it several times or, and listen to it. Um, fantastic. So now we come to the panel uh, discussion of um, our uh, time together. So Chinese migrants have been coming to this territory that we now call Canada since 1788 with the artisans brought by British fur trader John Mears to set up a trading post. And then uh, the Chinese came in larger numbers up to the United States during the gold rush of 1858 and then as workers for the CPR through the 1880s uh, with Chinatowns established across the country and subsequent waves of immigration in the 1980s and onward. So given this extensive history, what pointers can you give our audience about how to start writing their own poems that integrate aspects of Chinese Canadian history? Uh, Jimmy, James? Yeah. Um, well, it's a really big question because history in a way, um, when, when I think about history, it is a story. It's not just a collection of facts. Um, I remember learning about you know, historiography or the views on history, like who is doing the looking? Um, so when I think about writing about our history, it's about picking some facts and then picking a perspective. I think that really helps. It's not just about putting uh, historical things in order, but it's also about what is the, what is the intention behind the way that you uh, write about it. Um, so I think that, that's what I use anyway. But it's nice to ground um, the piece in something that has some facts. Great. Chris? Yeah, I think finding your touch points to, to things that are, that are very tangible to you. You know, history is such a broad concept and like Jimmy mentioned, it, it exists in history books. Whose history is in history books is a different, different question altogether. Um, but for me, when I write, I, I think a lot about the things that I can actually sink my hands into, right? So, you know, it's no coincidence that a lot of my writing centers around food because food has always been central to the history of my family here, right? And so many other countless Chinese families that, that were able to, you know, create their survival here by way of restaurants or, or laundromats. And so I think finding something tangible that works for you, you know, whether it's food or culture or language or, you know, trauma even, uh, and, and using that as kind of the, the initial thread for your prompt. And if you are trying to write something yourself, just pull that thread, see what comes out of it. Um, and, and often it's going to be pretty golden. Yes, I think those specific scenes, for example, Jimmy, in your poem of the cemetery and the heartbeat uh, and touching those stones and so forth. And Chris, we know we imagine those uh, uncles that the walk hay with the uh, cooking away. So those very specific concrete scenes we, we can relate to, even if we've not been actually in the kitchen, but especially if we have. Um, so each one of us has a specific memory of food, 
because we all eat to survive. You're all in this room and you're all uh, awake and to have your blood sugar up, I hope. Um, you've all experienced food. We all have smell and taste and um, we hear. Um, and bringing those sensory details into your work makes it come alive for us too. I also want to talk about time in your poem because of course history is a long time ago and um, it might seem disconnected, so far, far away. Even if we're in a room here, we can see the, the photographs and the faces. So poems can serve as a microscope, a magnifying lens, binoculars, or a telescope. It can be about a moment in time or a whole era or a combination. So can you talk, um, both of you, about your use of time in your poetry, how you manage to um, integrate that, um, jumping through in time? Chris? Sure. Um, I think it makes it more fun to write. You know, I think about uh, I think about my my the the history of my family in terms of my all the way back to my great great grandfather who came here and um, you know when I think of you know his experience uh, and and what it may have been like, I have no idea really, but. You think of the, remember that the uh, on CBC that the Canadian Heritage Moments. Some people might remember them. There's one where like they they send uh, the Chinese railway workers into the tunnel with dynamite, right? And then they're like, "Oh, this one definitely died." And then he comes like stumbling out, and it's like a great Canadian heritage moment because yeah. this, this frail Chinaman survived the collapsed railway tunnel, uh, which is uh, obviously a product of um, our socially constructed national identity, but. Uh, having visuals to to kind of provide me a bit of a landscape or a roadmap of like what it could have been like back then is really helpful. And then the first poem I did was all about thinking, okay, what into the future? You know, I have all this like anger and identity and exploration and all this stuff happening inside me. How would that translate to when I when I'm speaking to future generations? Um, and so I think being able to play across the landscape of time that way and the continuum of time is really, it just makes things more interesting. Because if I just like wrote about what I know in the present day, <laughs> I get like very dull very fast. My life is quite boring. So over to you, Jimmy. Yeah, uh, I also agree. I think, I think I can't ever know what it's like to live 100 years ago. And if I lived in that time, I, I don't know. Would I have made different decisions? Would I have um, done something different or would I also be in one of the photographs on the wall here? Um, what I can do in, in my art is to think about I'm here in the present looking at those other times. Um, even though I write about the past or sometimes imagined uh, alternative realities, it always situates in being here in our real reality today because we can't be in any other time. We can only look from our window to other times um, and imagine to the best of our ability. But we always, there's always a tinge of our present day in whatever we write. I think your poems create so much empathy for all those who came before us. And that make reading connection is what art and uh, literature can do um, when we read it and when we write it. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But in creating that art, it doesn't come automatically, you write it and suddenly it blooms as, an, as a, a beautiful piece. Can you both talk about what it took to write your work that you perform today? How many revisions, how much time? Jamie? Um, well, I think for me, I can't, it, it's really hard to force myself to write, but I have to do it. <laughs> um, and the process of revision is really painful for me because when I write a poem, I really like the first draft and it's like my baby and I don't want to change it. Um, but over time, you know, depend, different poems need different amounts of revision. Some are good to go after one or two revisions. Some I have to sit on for a year or longer and then come back to it and then I you know, change um, sometimes a large portion of it. Um, but whenever I edit, it always feels like I have to take away something. I'm almost like, almost like I'm carving out something that doesn't feel like it's quite right. And then I save it. I don't throw it into the trash. I keep it in a little folder and I might use it in another poem. 
Yeah. Um, I think similarly, I, uh, like I, I'm kind of always, like you, your mind doesn't shut off, and so I could be riding public transit or uh, for a walk with my dog or whatever, and, and, and something might be like, oh, that's a line. Uh, and I whip out my phone, I'll put it in my notes and be like, save that one for later. Uh, and then I frequently don't go back to those notes, but once in a while, the ones that stick in my head when I'm writing a poem, I'm like, oh, actually, I could insert that here. Uh, and it's kind of like, I don't know if you could consider it cheating when you're like using your own stuff in other poems. You probably noticed, like I use the visual of Chinese families split down the middle like steamed pork buns. I probably use that in all three of those poems. Because you like pork buns. Because, because I, <laughs> yeah, first off, cha si bao are fire. Secondly, um, I think it's a cool line. I think I like the visual of it, and I'm like, okay, so why would I just use it once? <laughs> you know what I mean? So maybe, I don't know if that's cheating or not, um, but, uh, but, but that's how it goes. And then f for myself, I think, and this is, I, I don't know if you have a question about the, the difference between spoken word versus, versus page yes. poetry. Spoken word is, is very much kind of predicated on a bit more rawness. I think, or no, I don't want to say that because page poetry is incredibly raw as well, but um, it's not as... Spoken word, like, there's a little bit more, I think, freedom for me to just come on the microphone and be like, blah, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't, it's not as polished all the time. And so, uh, because of that, I, I, I think sometimes um, I, I don't feel like my, my draft have to, has to be, like, A1. Like, I, I, I just write it, and then I'll speak it, and then when I speak it, that's when I'm like, that line is not good or that line is very good, and I should definitely keep that one. Um, and so I, I won't be able to like do a, a first pass out of it just in my notebook and be like, this is good or this isn't. I kind of have to gauge it off of um, how, what, what people are reflecting back to me when they hear it. Yeah, I think when, when one reads one's draft, one can immediately hear, oh, too many lines here, oh, mm -hmm. something's missing, uh, oh, this is really flowing well. Um, but both, in both of your work, uh, we hear it's very, very polished. I mean, you've performed these poems a number of times, and so we're hearing these beautiful, polished, radiant gems, and same with yours, Jim. When you did your book, Chris, did anything change when you had to transform your poem to uh, become a page poem? Um, it probably should have, uh, <laughs> but it didn't. Um, the full transparency, you're getting the behind the, <laughs> behind the, the, the veil uh, story here, is that um, I, I went to Ottawa for that Senate event with no poem in hand. What? Uh, and uh, I write well under pressure. <laughs> and so I went and got jerk chicken, and I went back to my hotel room, and I wrote from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., uh, and that's the draft. And um, it probably could use a bit more polish. But the publisher heard it in the Senate, and she liked it as it was, and so we just kind of went with it. But there's a few lines in there that I'm like, I would do that over, probably, yeah. Would you perform it differently? Yeah, I almost cried in the Senate, which is like uh, uncommon for me. I don't think there, there's nothing like there's nothing wrong with crying. I think I'm a very emotional person, but crying is not typically how I emote. And uh, it tripped up my rhythm in the Senate because I couldn't stop my lip from quivering, which is super annoying. Um, and so I think if I performed it again, I would try and be like, okay. But you know what? It's because I hadn't read it out loud yet, and so I was reading it out loud. And I'm like, oh shh. Sh <laughs> This is hard. Uh, but now that I've read it a few times, I think if I read it again, um, that's what I would do, is it'd be a bit more like strict. What I love about the poem that you read in the Senate, it draws from all over the place. And maybe because it was written in that condensed, compressed uh, situation, uh, so much pressure in a pressure cooker situation, um, it is so distilled and uh, very, very powerful and raw, so it's both polished and raw. You brought forward all your skills uh, that you've developed over the years into those few hours, um, as well as you know that, that your chassis bow and um, 
your experience and it all came out under fire in a crucible like that and it was very moving and powerful in the Senate. You can see uh, folks react in the Senate as well and people continue to react when they see the recording of it. I know folks who have seen that recording and uh, um, were very excited uh, by it. Um, so my question for you, uh, Jimmy, is can you talk about when you were writing that found poem, did you actually go to the cemetery and did you write it there? I mean, how did you actually compose it? So the, the cemetery in found was a mixture of the real cemetery. So I did go, I walked around, um, saw certain specific things that I wanted to incorporate into the poem and specific uh, objects or imagined objects. But also part of it was my memory of the cemetery when I was um, a kid. And that fusion of, uh, of both you know, past and present created a cemetery that I don't think exactly exists the way it is um, today, but it's kind of how I experience it. Great. So we're near the end of our time and there's so many other events going on, but I invite you to come up. They're not scary people. <laughs> They're poets who are willing to talk to you about your poetry, about your love of their poetry, um, and uh, to share with you uh, their experiences of, of being a writer. I want to thank the Chinese Canadian Museum for being so amazing in hosting this event and being open to poetry. Not every museum is. And to all of you for your incredible attention and presence today to celebrate together and commemorate together. So thank you very much and thank you to all involved.